morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're Is she here or we can hear her. Yeah. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey. Morning, Colin. Hi. Morning, Neil. Oh, oh, morning, and Rachel. You got video now? Yes. <laughs> Finally, took a while. <laughs> Technological <laughs> issues. Uh, I see. I have those a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing today. Aaron. Aaron. Yeah. It feels like it. So that's what it says in front of you. Morning, John. Nice to see you the other day. It now says the Vicarage Control Centre. Is that your friend? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no vicarage control <laughs> what? Uh, well that's uh, what I want to do. Um, if you if you could all see my computer oh, monitor goodness. you would sort of understand <laughs> all that's going on because I've got so many windows open in so many different places and I've got a feeling that at one point I need to do that oh Excellent. It, it didn't do what I thought it was going to do. So we are going to see how this works. I'd help if you got uh, two screens. Is this where uh, we lose you all together then? I hope not. I'll <laughs> still <laughs> <laughs> oh, deal with it. Good morning all and, and welcome to our church at home service. Uh, it's, it's great to see so many of you there. There are there are 47 screens attached, no, no, no. Oh, no. so that's probably about 60 of us also gathered together. Um, and it's a delight to see uh, so many of you here. Let's just, before we kick off, let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much. Yeah, yes. And that even in these times of isolation, times of difficulty, we can know your love afresh. Be close to us as we join together in worship this morning and fill our hearts afresh with your Holy Spirit to guide our worship and draw us close to you. Amen. 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 Uh, in our service today, just some things. Uh, Darren will be uh, preaching later on. Um, but Towards the start of the service, we'll also just be doing a little bit of commemoration of VE 75, which seems an appropriate thing to do as we <coughs> gather together. But let's begin with our opening responses. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. Who's that? We keep a Colin. moment of silence. I'm calling. Oh, Colin. Loads of people there. Loads. As we rejoice in the gift oh, of this new day, no, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, <coughs> now and forever. Amen. 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 
Happiness may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. God has been our refuge and our strength. Dear friends, in our worship today, we commemorate the 75th anniversary of victory in Europe. When the sounds of war fell silent on this continent. As we remember the many soldiers, sailors and airmen who gave their lives restraining evil and opposing tyranny. So we also come in thanksgiving for the years of peace that the nations of Europe have enjoyed since the Second World War. We keep a moment of silence as we remember. Those who gathered joyfully on that first victory day did so glad of each other's company and grateful for the laughter and love that follows times of sadness and loss. In these days of separation, we too long for such a day when we will know an end to our current battle and gather together in joy and celebration. Yet until that time comes, we meet conscious of our need for God's forgiveness for the sin and the desire to dominate others that leads to conflict between people and war between nations. The kingdom is yours, but we turn away from your just rule. Lord, have mercy. mercy. Lord, have mercy. The power is yours, but we trust in our own power and strength. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. <coughs> the glory is yours, but we fall short of the glory of God. Lord have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Almighty God who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all things and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Your salvation is near to those who fear you. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That glory be made well in our land. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Salvation is near to those who say you are the glory of your throne in our land. We say together. Let us pledge ourselves and now give the service to God and we just Keep a moment of quiet once more.
And now I'm going to ask Helen if she would, uh, Helen Shaw, bring us our first Bible reading. This is a reading from Acts 7, 55 to 60. But Stephen, full of Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he, held, when, when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Helen. Now I'm going to hand over to Linda, um, who is somewhere. I just need to unmute Linda. Oh, no, she was doing it herself. There we go. Linda. Good morning, everybody. Morning, Linda. Um, I didn't really think this through. Um, I am the way, the truth, the life. Uh, the internet comes up with all sorts of suggestions of building amazing church and guiding people through it. Um, that's not going to work. So I have found something and I hope it's going to work. So please bear with me as I try and share my screen. Do, 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 do. Share. Okay, so easy question. Who are these people? I can't hear anybody, so I'm going to imagine oh. you that. It would help if I could hear Colin. Hang on, hang on, I've got to find... Yeah, they all disappeared behind your screen. That's it, right. <laughs> Thank you. Royal well, family. This is the Cambridge. The Cambridge. The Cambridge. See them. Cambridge. The 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 Cambridge. Don't live in all of it, they just have a, an apartment. Yes. So, can anybody give me direct instructions how I can get from Christchurch to Kensington Palace? I don't want just down the motorway a bit and go left. <laughs> I need explicit instructions from Christchurch to Kensington Palace. Uh, no. Down the green. I'm going to put in. There we are. Our life is going to give me a definitive route. It's going to take go. 14 minutes and I head north on Rothley Road towards the Navins. You'll get stopped by the police. <laughs> <laughs> That's to be in lockdown. <laughs> For the services. You've got an excuse. Okay, so, the planner will give me direct instructions on how to get to Kensington Palace. There are other ways. There are sat-navs. Um, do have to be a bit careful though. This poor woman followed that now. <laughs> picture of Maria. Followed that now. Ended up in me. See the picture. Notice she's so warm. Yes. So even better than a, a sat nav or a route planner would be somebody sitting in a car with me and telling me to head north. <laughs> That's questionable. Well, <laughs> then we're going to pretend that whoever's in the car with me knows the way well and can give me direct how to get there. So that was a bit easy. Let's try. 
Let's try another one. So from Christchurch. Do you want to be too? I want to go. Oh, yeah, I've got it. Yeah, but it's not church. So. For That's right. That's all right. There aren't many, many options. It gives me an option to ever Street in London. That's not quite where I wanted to go. <clears throat> You show it was it was somebody who could actually show us the way to heaven. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he's willing to walk with us? Colin, I'm hard to hear, Linda. Okay, hang on a minute. Um, right. Okay, it's just you, Linda. Okay. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was somebody who would walk with us, show us the way? guide us to heaven well there is we all know that jesus can show us the way to our father's house jesus didn't say i can show you the way he said i am the way if we want to get to our father's house then we need to walk with jesus not follow the sat nav thank you Thank you very much, Linda. That's uh, a helpful, I think, a helpful little thought for us. I've just got to find my controls for you all. Um, and with that thought of how we get from places, from place to place, and from particularly from earth to heaven, uh, Mel is going to bring us our next Bible reading. The reading is from John chapter 14 verses 1 to 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is my Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I say, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Morning, everybody. Um, may I speak in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our reading this morning from John's Gospel is a well-known narrative, and it's sometimes read during a funeral service, and it's easy to see why. Jesus understands when we lose a loved one, the world would seem to crash around us, and all that is left is darkness. 
but he who is the light of the world gives us hope in his resurrection, that this fleeting life is not the end. He doesn't want us to be troubled or worried about those who have gone before us. As he says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. This promise of Jesus is a way of reassuring his disciples that though he is going away, it will be for their benefit. He won't forget them and he won't abandon them. That promise reaches out beyond the disciples. It breaks through the darkness of loss and embraces us all. When we can't see the way ahead of us and all seems lost, we need to know not only is there a way into an unknown future, but that he who came at Christmas time is waiting to greet us home. Perhaps this can also speak to us during these times of uncertainty. However, this passage speaks to us on so many more levels than simply saying that when you die, there is a place waiting for you in heaven. This is John at his absolute best. Not only are we given a clear Christological understanding of who Jesus is, it also tells us of Jesus's central message. And as I said, this has little to do with getting into heaven and has a lot to do with kingdom building. This may seem a controversial or unsettling message to our Western ears, but over the centuries we have somewhat lost the message of kingdom building. Jesus didn't say, repent and you get into heaven, although this is a part of his message, but I will argue not the central part. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. We find that in Matthew chapter 4. This is the revelation of new creation. We have numerous parables from Jesus telling us that the kingdom of heaven is like this or is like that. We've gotten so used to the Christian message of redemption that involves saved souls going up to heaven. This is true. However, it's not a new concept, as many of the Jews already thought this. No, Jesus' message is far more and far more radical. Here, especially in the Western churches, we have perhaps lost or have in the very least watered down the message of Jesus and the kingdom coming here on earth, a message that early Christians understood well. We read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, where the apostle writes, But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. And Jesus taught us, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. John gives us in this passage a glimpse of this new kingdom, echoing the old into the new, from Isaiah 65. See, I will, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. So here we have Christ fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. You see, Jesus' teaching about his father's house having many rooms could and probably would have been understood by his disciples and the early church differently from our own understanding. Jesus not necessarily talking about heaven, but rather the temple, a place where heaven and earth met. Something that his death and resurrection would soon destroy, the temple curtain torn and God no longer confined by the doctrine of the Jews. Heaven and earth meet here in Jesus and in his Holy and in the Holy Spirit, the advocate, which we will soon hear Jesus speak of. A new creation has begun. God and sin are reconciled. New creation on earth as it is in heaven. Being a Christian is much more than simply being a good person and therefore in turn buying your way into heaven. I think we can spend so much time as Christians thinking that this life we now inhabit doesn't count for much because our reward is to be found in heaven. And of course it is. But Jesus promised us so much more. With Jesus in our lives, then we have hope and through hope, peace. Especially when this life becomes a struggle, as I guess it is for many people right now. He came so we would have life and have it in abundance. It's about kingdom building, 
a new heaven and earth where God renews the whole of creation. Only this time it will be room for all. Jesus' message is not, hang on, there's more to come, but to give us life and meaning for life here and now. We heard this last week in John chapter 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This brings me on to the second part of this narrative, which concentrates on the Christology of Christ, about our understanding of whom this nomadic rabbi was. John is far and above the other gospel writers in understanding Jesus and his twofold affirmation of being both human and divine. Right from the offset, he proclaims who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We also have the seven I am sayings from Jesus, such as I am the bread of life. In our reading today, as Linda told us about, we have one of the most well-known I am sayings found in verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus continues, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I want us just to pause a little at this moment and reflect, especially on that line that says, no one comes to the Father except through me. You see, friends, this saying from Jesus found in John's Gospel has become especially in the last two centuries as we've moved out of Christendom one of the most controversial, even to some who profess a faith in the Lord Jesus. Why is this so? Because over time, some people have accused John and or Jesus of saying something they find very arrogant indeed. How dare he say the only way to God is through Jesus? What about other religions, other faiths? Friends, I've met some deeply committed Christians who have rejected the very idea of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Tom Wright wrote this. The trouble with this is that it doesn't work. If you dethrone Jesus, you enthrone something or someone else instead. The belief that all religions are really the same sounds nice and democratic, though study of religions quickly show this isn't true. All you're saying is that the reality who is God, the divine, is remote and unknowable, and that neither Jesus, nor Buddha, nor Moses, nor Krishna gives us direct contact with God. They all provide a way to the foot of the mountain, but not to the summit." Unquote. You see, Jesus does more than merely point towards God. Jesus and the Father are the one and the same. In Jesus we find God, and therefore a relationship with God which is not to be found in other religions, where God can be seen as distant and unknowable. An example of this understanding takes me back to a time in theological college during our interfaith module. We were asked to stand on an imaginary line painted on the lecture room floor. At one end was a group of people called the Universals. They could see God, Jesus in all world religions. In the middle, there was a group called the inclusives, they perhaps could see the Holy Spirit working in other, in other religions, um, but still were very centered on Christ. And down the other end were the exclusives, who only come, as Jesus said, to the Father through him. I remember thinking, this is wonderful. I love the notion that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is in all religions. And as I got up, I thought, I'm going to be somewhere down this end of the line. But something happened. I ended up the other end of the line. Me and two Pentecostal students stood uniquely at one end where other people were tended to move further down the line. And when I was asked why by the lecturer why I was there, it was, as I said, because I kept bumping into the cross of Christ. That's not to say that other religions and other faiths don't offer something, but for me, it is through the cross of Jesus. And John, now reading, is clear as to who Jesus is. I have many times tried to reconcile other religions to Jesus, but 
But as I say, I keep bumping into the cross of cavalry. If God is at work elsewhere in other religions, then it is of no business of mine as a Christian. I may be wrong in all this. If I am, I will stand before God on my judgment day. But God calls us through Christ. God did something unique. He started a revolution, something that changed the world and changed it forever. The world, whether it likes it or not, changed the day that Christ was born, died and resurrected. Friends, feel free to bump into the cross of Jesus. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? There I go again, bumping into the cross. So the question we need to ask ourselves when we read this passage of scripture is, dare you speak the truth that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life? Or do you water down his message that says the only way to the Father is through him? Simon Gilibad, a key speaker at this year's New Wine Leadership Conference, spoke of Christians around the world who are falling asleep to a demonic lullaby, of being afraid of speaking the truth found within the Gospels, including the difficult teachings that we sometimes find there, including things that others may reject and get angry about. There you speak of Jesus as the way, the truth and the life. Or are you drifting asleep to a dynamic lullaby? If the world is paranoid and threatened by the teachings of Jesus, then I take hope in this. Their hatred for Jesus only spurs my love for him. Whilst the world rejects him, we should find comfort in this rejection. The teachings of Jesus are powerful and life-changing. He understands this to be true. This is why he says, Whoever hates me, hates my father as well. Friends, I pray for the day when the kingdom of God is complete, for a new heaven and earth, when the whole of creation will come to Jesus and bow at his name. The world is crying out for kingdom building. Are you ready to join in? The world is crying out for Jesus. Don't deny him. I'll leave you with this passage from another of John's writings from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth have passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, see, I am making all things new. Amen. Darren, thank you for those words. There's a lot there for us to think about and to take in. We come now to um, our offertory hymn. And I'm not going to come round and collect all your money. Um, but you may be pleased to know, and some of you discovered it already, it is now possible to give to the work of the church by credit or debit card. Um, you can follow the links, stleonardswithland.org slash donate or mountsorrelchurch.org slash donate. Thank you for those who've already done that. Um, some of you give regularly by standing order, and I want to say thank you for that too. And at this point, I'm going to offer a prayer in thanksgiving for the donations that we receive electronically. Lord God, we know that everything that we have comes from you. We thank you that you give us the money that we need to survive. And we thank you for the offerings made by your people to the work of the church, whether by standing order or by direct payment or credit and debit card. Lord, we thank you. And we ask that you would bless those who give, that they might receive more. In Jesus' name. Amen.
And now we declare together the faith of the church. Do you believe and trust in God, the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now we're going to come together in prayer, and I'm going to invite Joe to lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray for the situations being faced by COVID-19. Across the world, we pray for leaders of all countries to have and know how to use the knowledge of the virus to make progress in-house to safely eliminate it. We pray for Boris Johnson and the government to maintain courage and determination to continue to carry out what needs to be done for this country. For people to realise, to understand and to act on all safety measures in order to overcome this virus. And for laboratory staff to discover quickly an antivirus formula that is safe to use and that works effectively. On Friday, and indeed this weekend, we can commemorate VE 75. But we must not forget that before VE, many lives were lost. Maybe COVID-19 will be a reminder of that because of all the deaths that, we have, that have happened since this pandemic started. Lord, we pray for the victory against this virus. Lord, in your mercy, Hear yeah. our prayer. During this lockdown, it has been so encouraging to see and hear about people putting themselves out to help others from shopping or delivering food and medication to calling in on those who are shielding, isolated or alone. For those who have taken up making PPE items like headbands, masks and scrubs. For the gratitude shown to many, many people as they applaud the work of the NHS hospital staff and other key workers, risking their lives by helping others. We thank you, Lord, for all of these people and ask you to bless each and every one of them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Hear our prayer. We pray that as we draw towards the easing of the lockdown, that the progress would be performed sensibly and sensitively, but as quickly as is safe to do. It is clear that there are people who might not want to wait for the right time. So Lord, we pray for you to help them to be patient. Lord, let us see workplaces reopened and quickly restored to full production. Schools, colleges and universities restored to their teaching abilities and sports events to be able to resume. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your comfort and peace to be with those who have been or are being affected by the coronavirus. Those who have lost friends and family members. We pray for protection of those who are shielding or isolating themselves. That you would keep them safe. 
We also pray for those who have any other ailment or illness or in need of hospital treatment or an operation, that normal conditions would resume in our hospitals. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the technology that's enabled so many people to be able to share in a variety of social active, sorry, social online activities, or as church groups joining in morning prayer or Sunday services such as this, bringing family and friends together, even though they're apart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue in prayer with the collect for this week. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, have overcome death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, Grant that as by your grace going before us, you put into our mind good desires, so by your continual help, we may bring them to good effect. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathering our prayers into one, let us pray together with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, we forgive those who sin against us. Just um, in the in the way of notices, really, it's have a look at the email that I sent yesterday because uh, all the links for all the online things that we're doing are in there. Um, it would be wonderful for you to be able to join us uh, at any occasion that you can. Um, you may have noticed in the news that the bishop has uh, started phase one of opening churches. I mentioned it in the email. Uh, in effect, it doesn't really make any difference. We still can't go in pretty much. I can, but you can't. So um, I don't see why I should be going into the church when you can't either. Um, so we'll continue meeting like this until we get further information. So the Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. We say together, grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ, the love of God, God the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, 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 Spirit with Lord, 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 Amen. 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 May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.